This is Sound Notion, the weekly podcast for new music and music news. I'm Patrick Gulo. I'm David McDonald. I'm Sam Mercier's. And this week we're happy to have on the show composer Danny Clay, who has collaborated with such esteemed artists and ensembles as the Kronos Quartet, Cincinnati Symphony, Cincinnati Ballet, The Living Earth Show, countless others. Um, he's here with us this morning, um, very early in the morning for him on San Francisco. And basically all we know is that he needs food badly. <laughs> Hi. Um, yeah, <laughs> so, this is true. This no. is true. <laughs> it's always the case. It doesn't matter the time of day, though. We really so. appreciate it that we we can get guests from the West Coast because we this is this is not super early for us on 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 Eastern time at eleven o'clock, but for you out out in San Francisco, it's it's an early morning for a weekend. So we yeah, appreciate you joining us this morning. Oh, it's fine. The last the last two weeks, you know, I've kind of been having to pop into school. Uh, really early for we've been doing summer camp so like the kids pop in their their parents drop them off between like seven thirty and eight so you know I, this is this is quite a bit more relaxed than being around you know a dozen kids at seven thirty in the morning <laughs> yeah well so you describe yourself as a as a composer and a teacher and and i would you say those are more or less like equal parts of of your career this is kind of like the weird cocktail conversation what do you well, what do you do and i yeah. think it's interesting that that uh you know most of the people that that come on our show are pretty definitely like i'm a, i'm a clarinetist i'm a violinist i'm a composer and and you are mostly a, a teacher so you can you maybe talk about how you got into um combining those two things yeah sure i mean if if you had asked me you know uh, a year and a half ago, two years ago, I would have told you I was a comp- just a composer. And I'd still like to think that I'm approaching this whole teaching thing mainly as a composer. Um, that's kind of still just the mindset that I'm, that I'm going in. And, and you know, there's, there's been a little, little bit of literature on this and stuff. But um, mm-hmm. if I had to be, like, really nitpicky about it, I'd probably go with teaching, teaching artist as opposed to teacher maybe. Um, because I think, um, I, I feel like lately for me more, my, my, my stronger suit is not being in a classroom with kids all day. I definitely found that out this past year. (laughs) Um, but, but, you know, popping in and kind of, um, I don't know, getting, getting kids riled up about music. So, so you're like the, the cool uncle who has none of the responsibilities. Yeah, you know, I, I still have some, I probably have more responsibilities than I should, but yeah. (laughs) Okay. Um, and so, yeah, b- about two years ago, I took this this little. I, I went to the uh, San Francisco Conservatory for composition for my masters, and then uh, they, there was this little class put on by the San Francisco Opera because they have a big teaching teaching artist uh, program department. Um, and I took this class. I thought it was pretty cool, and so I got a little bit of time uh, with kids, and I ended up s- starting these. Um, I, I did a few composition projects that involved that involved kind of like crowd like kid sourcing material um and that and that kind of led to to the teaching gig so it, so it's really been from a composition to teaching sort of trajectory and yeah so now it's uh, um i think i think teacher like teaching artist and like kind of curating curator of of projects with kids composition projects with kids yeah that's very cool and you know we we first uh learned about some of the stuff that you were doing through larry and arlene dunn who we had a great conversation with on the show uh in june i believe uh in april was it really that oh my gosh sound notion 160 time flies man Mm -hmm. uh but uh we were talking about some composition projects that, that they were working on and that they had been working on with, with you. Um, so can you maybe tell us a little bit about how you uh, work with young students on composing? Because it often feels like we wait to talk about composition until much later in music education. Like It's not something that I really considered until I got to college even. Um, yeah, 
Yeah, I know what you mean. And um, I think now there's kind of this movement. I mean, I have admittedly need to do more research than I have, but um, there's this, 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 no, this kind just of. Just do it. Just do it and don't, and think don't that I it. invented everything. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we've, all, we've all done that with pieces. Yeah, mm-hmm. this is, I'm the first one. And then, no. <laughs> And then but, George um, Crumb did it in 1963. It's always – George Crumb always did it first. Right. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, if we can take anything from this. But uh, yeah, uh, with the – let's see. With the, with the composing, it seems like there's all these movements popping up now. Um, in – let's see, in New York, there there's this Young Composers and Improvisers workshop where they are using this uh, this online program called – ooh. Uh, not Sound Notion. That's the name of this show. Um, it's, uh, it's it's some kind of online um, online program, and it's basically like a like a simpler finale. And they've got these uh, fourth, fifth, sixth graders. Note just, flight. You know, note flight. That's it. Thank you. Um, that we actually is, had uh, the founder of Note Flight on the show last year. No kidding. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah, and, and it's it's like it's this big thing, especially with this group. And so this guy, Matt McLean, I think has worked, um, worked the whole curriculum around it. And so he's got these fourth and fifth graders, just, they are learning the basics of music through music notation, basically. Um, I haven't done as much with that because I'm working with the younger kids, mainly like my range is kindergarten through fifth grade. And so we've been, we usually start, um, I mean, every project has a different kind of emphasis, but basically it's about getting a visual correlation with sound. And um, so it it usually starts with graphic stuff. Like most of my stuff has been graphic based and getting them to associate, like in my mind, again, I don't, I mean, I haven't been doing this super long, but in my mind, like, you know, if you are associating symbols with sounds, that's the majority of music literacy right and then and then it's just a matter of getting the right symbols to correspond to the right sounds yeah maybe i mean um, to, to me music writing music in a lot in, in a big way is like programming you know it's an input output thing you put in this stuff and you get back this noise mm-hmm. and getting kids to get keen to that idea at an early age is a good thing i think absolutely um oh, i'm glad and like and then, and then there's the big, the, the, the kind of wiggle room is in the interpretation of things. And so depending on different, uh, different projects kind of, and how, um, how strict the variables are and stuff, um, you know, the, the ki- so if the kids are performing these, whatever, these graphic pieces, there's, there's all this room for interpretation, right? Um, uh, so that, that visual audio kind of correspondence, it's, it started for me with this, um, this project where I went into a classroom and I played the opening bars of uh, Beethoven's Grosse Fugue, the, just the overture, it's like uh, seven or eight notes, just this big like octave thing. Um, and I played it for them, and they had to draw sort of what they thought the music looked like. They had to draw, like sort of sketch out the contour of the piece or whatever. And so working from that, um, they had the drawings... I, they, they had they had made all these drawings, 27 drawings, and I collected them all and then f- gave them to a string quartet to interpret. And so it's kind of a big back and forth process. But but what ended up happening was they, um, you know, the kids got a chance to hear this this active interpretation of their drawings and really kind of see how that works, that visual audio correspondence. And how, um, do, how do the kids feel about the, the sounds that come out of it? Because, you know, listening to a lot of this stuff, it's, 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 it's pretty wild sounds. Mm-hmm. Um, and and this, the sorts of, of sounds that, you know, relating it to um, uh, music education and teaching new music again later, uh, like, it, like it did earlier, when you hear those things for the first time when you're a little bit older, there's kind of two groups of people there's a group of people that says whoa that's kind of wild let's let's see what that's all about and then there's the other group of people that at best says well that's not for me um Mm -hmm. how do the kids react to those wild string sounds um i think you know the the younger they are the more open-minded they tend to be really yeah um i mean it's because they aren't quite they, they aren't um you got to think like music with so many things is kind of like when you're kind of when you're younger 
just like your habits in school, you know, your uh, peer pressure and things like that, what you're exposed to, what your brother listens, what your older brother listens to, what, you know, all your friends are listening to, all these things kind of whittle away into an opinion about music. And no one's exposed to these kinds of crazy sounds liberally when they're young. You know, everyone's playing for them, you know, um, like what, like pop music and whatever kind of children's songs they're listening to. And I think that, that, that tailors their their interest in it. And it gives them a like a conception of what music is and what it shouldn't be. And so I think most people, like a lot of teachers would hear these these like crazy scratchy sounds and probably say something like, you know, this isn't, you know, this isn't music. This isn't what we consider music in the world. <laughs> but um, I think I think just allowing that in, allowing that exploration, and for for them, like a big a big facet of it is knowing that they were responsible for the noise, right? Like yeah. taking that ownership. It doesn't. It almost doesn't matter what it sounds like to an extent, right? Right, um, and they made it, and they, and not only did they make it, but they, they they like directed other people to make the sound. Like they are the pulling the puppet strings. Exactly, and I think and I think that could be really useful for them. I think that's the moment where it clicks is not necessarily just hearing the sounds, but getting to like interact with the performers, which yeah. is hard. It's hard to get it, it's hard to get opportunities like that, but unless you know it's one or two people with the string quartet, it was hard. But um, yeah, getting them to sort of tweak the sound and realize that you know it is in their control, and it and there's this it's this system of interpretation and symbols, and I don't know. Yeah, it's very it's complicated. No, but... <laughs> I, I I think I know what you mean. Well, maybe we should uh, maybe we should play this this piece for everybody here since we've been talking about it a little bit. Um, do you have any? You, you kind of talked about it uh, already. Do you have anything else you want to say to set it up? So we're going to uh, see, we're going to hear the music and see the, the, the score as it goes by, right? Yeah. Um, so yeah, basically, so this piece, uh, I was asked to do like a three minute string quartet for a educational benefit show with, uh, this group in the, this, this, this mainly West coast based, uh, organization composers and schools in concert. Um, and instead of, and I figured I could write like a three minute string quartet, but it probably wouldn't end up being very good if I did it myself. So I thought maybe I would try giving, giving um, like you know around thirty mini world premieres. <laughs> so that that's kind of how it led to led to the kid the kid project. All right, and who who what's the name of the quartet playing this again? Friction Quartet. Okay, Friction Quartet. Excellent. So uh, for those of you that are listening to the audio, you're just going to hear the, the Friction Quartet play these or interpret these, these graphic scores from uh, the students. If you're watching the video, you're actually going to see those graphic scores go by for each of these short pieces. E each one of these is just a few seconds long, right? Yeah. Okay. So here this is, uh, well, uh, you'll see it, but it's, it's, it's 27 pieces by the Friction Quartet and uh, Danny's students.
Hey. So that was the Friction Quartet performing 27 Overtures by Danny's students, arranged by him. Uh, and I, it was some really cool stuff. But I was just saying to the guys in our in our back channel that I, I really dig the the one with all the arrows pointing to the center that slowly <laughs> comes comes into the the unison pitch. How much of that? So so you said this was arranged by you. Were they the, were the the performers actually looking at those graphic scores, or had you done some other version of a score for them? Oh, I think I think I gave you a page. It's called twenty seven O page, um, and that that's the that's one page that's this? of the score that they got. Yeah. So I mean, really, what I did, um, some some of these were were uh, the kids more so than me, and some of them were me more so than the kids. Um, like I sequence them out. I picked the order for them and I think the durations for them. But they gave me they gave me a lot of the different sound qualities and stuff like that. Some of these descriptive words. Um and then I think the um really I kind of had to figure the rest out, figure out how to turn this into like a cohesive piece because this was really just a giant experiment um and so yeah certain liberties were my own like i like interpret deciding to interpret the pictures as as non-string sounds and things like that um so there was a only a little bit of back and forth in this particular project but this was my first my first shot at it so um go moving out from here the process became a little bit more in, interactive so when you were actually, oh, go ahead, Patrick. I just wanted to ask a quick question about when you were going over this project with the students. Um, were you like actively showing them and working them, working with them, and a in a quartet sh and saying like this is a pizzicato, like you can do this sort of thing on here? Um, Un unfortunately, no. This was almost purely kind of a bat. Like, hey, let's try out drawing these bring back some sounds. Hey, this is kind of what it sounds like. I mean, I, I talked to them about the string quartet, but the resources at this for this project didn't involve a live string quartet. Trying it out later with, with friction quartet, um, it, it ended up being a lot, just, it, it made a lot more sense to everyone that way. Mm -hmm. um, but for this particular one, no. So orchestration wasn't included in that lesson. No, they, they, they knew they knew that they had four instruments at their disposal. <laughs> um, and and you know, and I and we did a very short sort of primer on, you know, how would you draw we, we I so the with this one it was like, you know, breaking down sound into different qualities, high, low, short, long, loud, soft, and how would you draw like a high short sound versus like a low, long, loud sound. And so that was kind of how, how we started it off. And obviously you can tell like to varying degrees of uh, earnestly trying to like figure out the sound to like, you know, I'm just going to draw a dinosaur. But either way. Uh, <laughs> I, I when think, given the opportunity, I think you'll find a lot of small children want to draw the dinosaur. I kind of would write, like to draw the dinosaur. Well, and I think I think we we're all glad that that someone drew a dinosaur, right? <laughs> uh, and 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 so even if and, and I have that you know in every class I have like a two two kids two or three kids that just want to draw and doodle, but um, using that to an advantage instead of frowning on it usually I mean that's that's what I've tried to do. So like you know in the end interpreting a picture can be just as cool even if it's not exactly hitting the like pedagogical point that i want it to <laughs> did you talk to the the kids later did you feel did, did they did they think you know the, the well, well i'll ask you the this more general question what did the kids think of the the thing did they feel like it reflected what they had done yeah i they they loved it i mean i think they i think the the biggest thing that they got from this was feeling um feeling part of sort of a cohesive whole that they wouldn't have gotten if it had just been peace, applause, peace, applause, peace, applause. Um, and so I think it, it, in in the same way, a lot of these projects, this project, you know, it's it's a lot like a like an art project more so than a music project. You know, sort of a collage where 
you know, you say you've got like, I don't know, a quilt or something and everyone's got one square in the quilt and they can appreciate that their, their, their square is there, but they can also see how it connects to all the other ones. Yeah. I, I get. I guess that's that's kind of how they 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 responded to it. Again, since there wasn't a live quartet, I felt like there was uh, there was a little bit less distance. There there was a little more distance and a little less ownership than I would have liked. And so that's why I'm fortunate to have been able to sort of keep working on this with different classrooms. Very- do you have any? Do you, did you have any students who, after this experience, seem to have a peaked interest in composing? Um, yeah, certain, certain, uh, kids seem to seem more keen than others and respond better to this idea, um, that like, that you can take images and turn them into sound basically, or take, take, you know, drawn out ideas and turn them into sound. And it's been fun. It's been fun to work with, you know, I have a little bit of after school time and it's fun to work with those kids. Uh, the hard part is figuring out, um, you know, the, the, and the tough thing about being a composer for all of us, unless you're a particularly good instrumentalist as well, is like, you know, how do you hear your stuff? How do you hear these ideas that you have? And um, that's, that's I think, probably the biggest roadblock for them, as it is for me sometimes, too. Um, and so getting them, getting them to... Uh, use an instrument or use, in, in many cases, we use, like, you know, an iPad or garage band has been really useful for us um to mm-hmm. to get them to kind of like realize these scribbles into into sounds mm-hmm. yeah um do you have a do you do any kind of like recorder class or do they have a recorder class or anything at the school we we have i have a big box of recorders up here and i haven't <laughs> i i wasn't i didn't have the guts to uh to bring them out this past year cuz uh man that's a lot of like sanitizing yeah. to do <laughs> well like i was thinking you know you could be recorders and i was probably in the 10 seconds while i was thinking of the question i was bowling it over and going oh, i don't know the same way you probably did yeah mm-hmm. but uh that might be a cool next step is to say okay you can actually work with some specific uh instruments and and some specific pitches and stuff so um, yeah that's a good idea i'm all right yeah, I have, a, I have a friend who uh, who teaches elementary music, and and I, every once in a while I'll be over at at her house, and she's got like armloads of these recorders that she's just running through the dishwasher. Mm-hmm. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> oh, dishwasher! Yeah, that makes sense on the little spikes. Yeah, yeah, exactly. This was she, it's like just like a little forest of of recorders <laughs> at the bottom of her dishwasher. Um, Actually, I have a a, a method for. Uh, coming up with a way to control recorders that would be really simple. It's actually related to a piece that I'm working on okay. for sax and clarinet. But if you think, even if you have, I know recorders come in different pitches, but I would be willing to, I mean, I don't know what the standard pitches of recorders are, but like uh, if they're anything like band instruments, woodwind instruments, you have a left hand and a right hand. So you could do something very simple about move your right hand, left hand up and down, move your right hand up and down, you know, like yeah. so. You're controlling, you have basically four notes per recorder. You have left hand up or down and then right hand up or down, right? So, and, and that's kind of, I mean, that's a real easy way to have them control a real instrument and get some, some specific pitch content, but the way, the, the really limiting how much they control so that, that it doesn't get out of hand. You know, yeah. every, all composers know that the problem isn't coming up with, uh, an idea it's limiting the idea enough that you can get it down you know right so for this so for this piece that you're working on is it, it it's it's about the hands like well it's or... it's uh it was it's commissioned by a friend of mine who plays a lot with he's a clarinet player and he plays a lot with a friend who is a sax player and i play clarinet and sax and i wanted to really investigate and i'm trying to figure out a way to incorporate my work as a repair technician into it and i was just thinking about you know both of them operate this way and this way, and then they both have ways that they get across the break. And so there's like mechanical similarities and there's mechanical dissimilarities to the way they work. And so I'm going to like sort of demonstrate those in the piece. Awesome. I like that. And as a, as a fun side note that I didn't realize until I started working on this, that an A clarinet and a alto saxophone both have the same lowest note. That's, that's a... 
for me, that's a piece right there. Just like the <laughs> lowest. <laughs> um, that's, I love, yeah, I love the hand idea. And I feel like uh, for kids, just getting them to do yeah. that like, is enough. Too, that's, though, that's, an, that's like an assignment in itself. That's, that's like homework. <laughs> right. Well, and, ki- and kids, I think, are, are good at like connecting those those different sensations like the 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 sound of those things to the 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 kinesthetic motion of the thing they're doing with their hands or the visual drawing that they're making they they can make those abstract connections um really really in interesting ways that i think a lot of times uh older students have difficulty with uh, i wanted to talk a little bit about the the project that you were working on that that larry and arlene were involved in we talked to them as sam said in april uh about this piece that they were working on and and they sent us the score and it had these pictures of matchbox cars and it had these these symbols of different things the students were doing with their desk and with their books and with uh the, the just classroom objects um, can you tell us a little bit about how, how that project came about? Yeah, sure. Um, basically, you know, in, in reading about, about composing with very young kids, the idea came up about, you know, having a key, a, uh, having a key and creating symbols associated with, with like specific sounds, which seems, you know, which makes perfect sense, right? It's like and developing so, a notation system. Exactly. And so, I mean, I, and I felt so dumb that I hadn't thought of that before because <laughs> I was doing more this sort of like listening and responding, like with the, with the uh, piece that, that we just played, you know, having the kids sort of, it, it's, it's sort of free form in that way. And that leads to, that's, it's a great, it's a great thing, but it leads to like a lot of confusion, especially for younger kids. And so really, again, like, like we were talking about before getting that direct, like, specific image to sound correspondence um this seemed like a way to do it so with with each grade they developed their own keys for specific sounds um and i think you have you have a couple of different ones um yeah uh this let's see the uh let's say um the third grade key so with the with the older classes, they broke up into groups and they had. Oh wait, let's see. I mean, I can. I, I'm just cycling through them. I don't oh, that's know, okay. Have the names. Is yeah, the that's the. It's a. We called it a sound inventory, and uh, so each each class broke up into uh, into groups and had one material. So there was like desks and pencil boxes and. Um, Something. Oh, uh, let's see. Paper, paper, just different kinds of paper. And they all came up with, they all just like experimented with the different sounds they could make and then made like these, these keys for it. And so after that, they started composing their own pieces with that, which is the one where sort of, it's like the same symbols, but it's all, um, it's all like lined up and the kids sort of had to develop their own yeah, they had to develop their own way of writing it out. I liked this one especially because it had rhythms and it also has parts, like the little cursive initials are who's playing what and stuff like that. Oh, cool. Um, and so they sort of invented their own system for that. But then, you know, at the end of the day, we had this conversation about they if made this is... counterpoint. Yeah, it's, it's so cool. It's so cool. And, like, I was I was tickled to death, but... You know, asking them about it, they felt like, you know, these are not musical sounds. And so, you know, they didn't feel they felt like, you know, it was following instructions more so than making making um, art or whatever, making music, I should say. Um, And so as a response to that, I kind of just asked different composers to take these symbols because, you know, like any notation system, these these composers could could take these symbols and make a piece. And so I asked, um, I think seven composers to do just that, to make, to make pieces using these symbols. Um, so for that, for this particular one, that third grade class, Phyllis Chen, the, uh, New York, New York based, uh, composer, toy pianist. She yeah. did a score. Um, I think let's I've see. Got that as well somewhere. It's, um, using the same symbols and, 
Yeah, let's see. I think it's called Object Phyllis. Um, Object Third Phyllis. Phyllis Chen's been really awesome in in kind of popping into our class via Skype and stuff like that. And um, she, we also did a different project together. That's what this music box um, music box thing is from. Um, but basically, what she did was she took all these symbols and she turned it into this really straightforward piece where there it is, where they have these different symbols. She times it out and um, she gives them all these, all these different uh, like sort of performance qualities to play with. And so this started to sound much more musical and much more interesting to them. That's very cool. Yeah. So she is she's taking their symbols and and using her own, you know, compositional intuition to create new things with them. She's not using any of those those shapes that they had put together, right? Yeah, she's not using quite the same like layout as them. I think she she toned it down a little bit. She made it instead of having parts, she made them, you know, every everyone's playing kind of as a unit. Yeah. But and so was, then did she did she return the score to you and th that you could perform with the class? Yeah, exactly. She sent it to us and we recorded it. Nice. Nice. Yeah. And so is that one of these recordings that's going to to this new this new recording project? This yeah. project object? Yeah, pro so project object was started well, I, I, I started up the SoundCloud because Larry and Arlene wanted a recording of their of their of uh, their piece and uh, they thought they said it would be easier to put on SoundCloud, so I thought, okay, I should probably just take you know take a night and upload all of these recordings that I have. And it's been something that I wanted to do, and I I, I want to start it up for for real when the school year starts. But having the kids sort of run their own record label, in a way, or their <laughs> own their own net label rather. That's delightful. Where no where no money is exchanged whatsoever. <laughs> right. <laughs> but but they get to put awesome stuff on the internet that they can share with people on Facebook. Yeah, exactly. That's that's the idea. So I've so I've this is sort of a compilation of projects that we worked on last year. And, this is uh, so much better than like doof, doofus kid like pageant kind of performance. <laughs> like you can share this with your family because it's on the internet, and you can just like blast everybody. Like, hey, look at this cool thing. That we made. That's, that's the way. Every, every that's the way the the conversation always goes. It's like we're gonna be on YouTube, you know. We're gonna be famous. We yeah. need royalties, and I'm like, guys, if only you knew. Yeah. <laughs> well, that, I mean, that's that, and you tell them, you know, that's that's how Justin Bieber became Justin Bieber is making YouTube videos of his music that he wrote, and then and then now he's a broken pop star. So exactly. your students can aspire to that level of brokenness. <laughs> you can be broken too, or you can be a, you can be an experimental music composer and just set the bar very low for the rest of your life. You know, <laughs> sounds good. That sounds good. Those are, two, those are basically the, the only two options for most third graders. I think <laughs> that's true. Yeah. We got to narrow it down now. <laughs> right. Right. Um, so this is great. So we should expect to see more stuff uh, in this, in the same category this year. Hopefully, yeah. This is it's kind of it kind of works on a project by project basis. Um, you know, I'd like to do more. I'd like to get more composers doing these um, classroom key pieces. If any, if any of you guys are interested, um, you know, just take take a, taking a day and sort of putting together a score from different from these different symbols um, and. Bringing in bringing in guest composer or guest performers rather, and doing different instrument demos and creating pieces around that. The last one we did, which I haven't put up yet, is a, a friend of mine, a pianist named Ann Rainwater, came in and uh, we did all prepared piano and uh, you know extended piano stuff. And so all the kids did a similar thing where they created symbols, but it was for you know for experimental piano sounds. You know that that actually reminds me of a question that I that I that I meaning to ask. So we talked earlier about how kids are really open to these kind of crazy sounds. What do the parents think when they've been in music class and they come they come and see what their kids been working on in music class this week, 
and it's this thing that's like rustling papers and scratching sounds on the desks and and making st string overpressure noises. <laughs> um, well, I should I should add that everyone has to sing in choir. Okay. Um, <laughs> and and you know, so that's based, like your buffer. Based on my talents, though, choir is a lot less fun <laughs> than music class, and so. If anything, I'm turning people off from choir and on to, uh, you know, all this all this this weird sound stuff. But, um, yeah, you know what? I, I really think it's all about how you spin it. I think I think um, for parents, if they look at if they look at this more like, you know, art performance projects, uh, it, it, it makes like like the um, especially when when the, it's involved, when the videos are involved and things like that. I think, again, like. For for both the kids and and for the parents, this visual this visual element is 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 a really big part of it. I haven't played I don't I haven't played um those like the object pieces the the desk and classroom sound pieces for a parent and got their their feedback on it. I'll need to do that at some point. Um, I since it's the summertime, it's hard to tell. I haven't received right. any angry emails though. So any angry emails like <laughs> what you call us crap music. None of that. <laughs> yeah, I'll have to have a parent workshop then. That would yeah. be fun. That would actually be really cool. Get have, them, the, get them in our... have the parents do the same thing and see yeah. what they come up with. I bet they'll come up with something a lot less interesting. Probably. Yeah, yeah that's that's the sad part. It's it's sad that as you get older, you get... Well, for, for a lot of people, as you get older, you get less creative unless you're... I mean, I'm sure I would come up with something less interesting. <laughs> I, I don't I don't know about that. The, the only the only thing I I worry and what I what I need to do more is like if I'm teaching this style I need to be like I feel like I need to be practicing what I preach you know what I mean I need to do I need to get some more uh you know get some more stuff like this in my own music is what I'm feeling yeah like um but um, getting oh good no go ahead go ahead. Oh, uh, I don't remember what I was going to say. <laughs> well, I was going to say it's interesting that uh, doing a little bit of research, getting ready for having you on the show, um, it's clear to me that graphic notation with, in the context of kids and school is really common in the UK. Really? Um, yeah. Um, and uh, also, uh, just as a point of uh, interest, Michael Colgrass has a graphic notation system that he developed for kids um that uh has been adopted in a lot of secondary or elementary education programs in canada and you can look at the the syllabus and everything online mm. oh awesome um do, is there a name for that system uh let's see it is called this is a great show. It's called "Listen to Four Guys Googling Things." Really, yeah. <laughs> Sorry. This is our this is our this is our new Here show. The sound called, the sound of four dudes googling. Teaching, teaching children to create music using graphic notation. Fantastic. If you type graphic notation, Michael Colgrass and Google, you'll get it. All right, I'll I'll save it for after the show. Didn't yeah, didn't yeah. Colgrass have Colgrass had this uh, this piece? I remember uh, the, my undergraduate composition teacher introduced me to this piece by Colgrass called As Quiet As. Have you guys heard this piece? I've heard the name. but So it's, it's based on this, this project that some writer or some poet or something, somebody did in, in a classroom where, and, and got published in like some, some literary magazine or maybe it was Reader's Digest, who knows. But um, they had asked students to think of the things that they could be as quiet as in the classroom to like get them to calm down and be quiet uh but to think about things that they could compare their quietness to and this like some of the students wrote these amazingly poetic phrases about being as quiet as something and it was like as quiet as ants walking and as quiet as time passing and things oh, like yes, that. Oh yes, I have heard of this. And yeah. and so Colgrass took some of those and wrote little um uh, uh little tone poems on those lines of of poetry that those kids had had kind of inadvertently written about quietness. Um, oh, that's awesome. I love that. The the piece is called As Quiet As, I believe. He, uh, Colgrass actually writes lots of young, uh, band music. Uh, when I was at New Mexico, we were recording music because we would, you know, do stock recordings of, of middle school and high school band pieces. For like catalogs? And, 
yeah, and this is a, you know, a really good group, at least half graduate students, playing a piece by Michael Colgrass that's nothing. It's two, four time with half notes and quarter notes. And that's and it. it's really groovy. <laughs> really, and, and it works out a way to be cool and defy your expectations such that people who are graduate students in college are playing these really simple rhythms wrong because he leads you into thinking it's going to do A and it doesn't do, it does, you know, fish, <laughs> not B. <laughs> so, yeah, really cool. Yeah. I'll have to check that out. Yeah, it seems like the uh, band, especially like, yeah, youth band music is, is you know, that, that there's there's quite a big, like, rep there. Um, like creative with, with, with band, with band in general, I mean, I've never written a band piece, but, uh, with band in general, it seems like everyone's like constantly trying to reinvent the band, you know what I mean? And so, right. uh, especially as it pertains to like younger kids, I would be really interested to hear what kind of stuff, what kind of stuff's going on there. Yeah. We don't have, we don't have an instrumental music program here, unfortunately, but, um, so, so we kind of have to play on our desks. But <laughs> well, you got the desks and you got the recorders. What more wouldst thou? Exactly. <laughs> uh, so we, I don't want to. I don't want to uh, avoid your music at all because you've got these really great educational projects. But um, maybe you could tell us about some projects that you have coming up as a composer. Sure. Yeah. Um, lately, just given sort of my my time and resources have been doing a lot of electronic music and um, kind of hoarding cassette tapes and doing a lot with recording stuff on cassette tapes in my little tiny room. Um, but I have this this piece going on um, in about a month, a month and a half, with this pianist out here, uh, Sarah Cahill. Um, and she's playing a piano that's going to be hauled out in the middle of a redwood forest the Oakland Regional Redwood Park or something. So they're, wow. they're putting a piano out in the middle of the woods, and uh, I'm writing a piece for the piano. Uh, <laughs> for for Specifically for the piano in the woods? Like, would it, would it work in, in another setting? Or is it, like, is there something specific to the piano in the woods set, set up? I don't, it's, it's, hard to, it's hard to tell. I mean, I, I the way I see it, I mean, I'd like, I'd like to, the thing to get, like, you know, to get at least another play, <laughs> you know, <laughs> like if a piano piece is played in the woods, does it make a sound? <laughs> yeah. Like if so like whoever's location, hearing it. Hmm? Is the location of where this is first being performed informing your composition? Yeah, definitely. I mean, I feel like it, it has to. I mean, it's, it's, it's enough. I, I, I feel like if I just do something that's nature based, it doesn't feel like quite enough. So and, and it's right along the trail. So people will be walking by, listening for a second, and then walking away. And so the way the way that I'm trying to think about it, I've always wanted to do like a longer piece, like you know, like a half hour, forty minute, something or other with instruments. So um, the way I see it, it's going to be kind of like any other thing in the any other noise making thing in the woods. It, it makes sound kind of similar sound for a long time and evolves a little here, a little there. And then eventually, you know, and, and, and so someone that's walking through the woods kind of like catches on to a cool sound, walks over, listens for a little bit and then walks on. But that's that sort of sound is, is still going on. So that doesn't sound alone sounds extremely boring to the for the, for the performer. So there's going to be a little bit more gradation within that. But kind of uh, kind of that idea, like maybe maybe like a John Luther Adams type, you, you know, um, how the. Like his, some of his bigger pieces um, kind of exist, and they and they go through these these sort of cycles of things, and I don't know, something like that. All right. Um, I would be curious as to uh, what birds are native there. If you're lucky, like some kind of crazy mating season thing will be going on with crazy bird noises and stuff. That's that's what I'm. That would be awesome. I went to the I went to the space a month ago, and it was like dead quiet. There was like no uh, nature sounds anywhere. I don't know what was going on. It was it was kind of a bummer. <laughs> but um, the, oh, the other the other thing that I'm that I'm playing around with is uh, there's this there's this group based in the East Bay, based in Berkeley, called Thingamajigs, where they you know they focus on homemade instruments and things like that. And there's a big kid element. And so I'm thinking I'm I'm doing a workshop with them next week. And so I'm thinking that they. Um, I might have kids build sort of wind-powered instruments or little natural 
uh, noisemakers that also kind of are set up around the piano, giving it kind of a um, extra layer of uh, sound activated by nature. Hmm. Yeah, we'll see. A lot of ideas and very little time to flesh it out. That's really cool. (laughs) Um, Yeah, so hopefully... That hopefully that'll be cool. That that to me that's cool because it's hopefully if I can bring in like the teaching element too, I'll be curious to see how that dynamic works between sort of me and some of my students and and a performer. Um, yeah, excellent. Yeah. Well, and 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 you've got a lot of your stuff up on Bandcamp and and SoundCloud yourself. Um, so where can people check that stuff out? Yeah. Uh, f- for me, uh, yeah, DannyClay.BandCamp.com is good. And, um, and then for the project object stuff, it's uh, soundcloud.com slash project object net label. Excellent. Um, so listen, it's been really great talking to you. Uh, we had a, we had a, uh, a really great conversation. We don't really have a lot of news this week. We do have a, a little bit of kind of sad, uh, obituaries last week at just as we were publishing the show, we read of Lauren Mazel's passing, um, he passed away complications due to pneumonia. Um, and, uh, you know, there's not a lot that we can say that has not already been said. One of the, the great conductors of the, the 20th and 21st centuries. Um, so I, there's been a lot written about him. We'll have links to, to a few of our, our favorites in the show notes. Um, Sam, you had, you had some other, also, um, uh, blues fans, well, let me give you the quote when Rolling Stone magazine introduced this guy to the world. Quote, if you could imagine a 130-pound cross-eyed albino with long, fleecy hair playing some of the gutsiest, fluid blues guitar you've ever heard, then enter Johnny Winter. Um, so his brother is a great uh, saxophone player, too. Anyway, he passed away um, the official 63rd greatest guitar player of all time, according to World of Stone. Well, and and so that is that does get him into the playoffs, I think. <laughs> I think so. Um, also, I don't know if you guys spoke about it a little bit ago, but composer Seymour Barab died um, at the end of last month. Um, opera number composer. Of, uh, yeah. He ran, especially for college and uh, and younger people too. He did a lot for them, um, so he will be missed as well. He was ninety three. And in other news, we're not going to talk about it this week because there wasn't really anything that interesting happened except for people <laughs> shouting. Uh, the Metropolitan Opera is still a mess. That's the news. Yeah. The Metropolitan <laughs> Opera remains a hot mess uh, with like 87 different labor unions and Peter Gelb being... Question- a gelb. Qu- Peter Gelb's questionable competence. Um, <laughs> I'll leave it there. Everyone's uh, dying and the world is a mess. It's a lot like an opera, actually. Oh. Um, mm-hmm. It's like, it's it's meta. You see what I did there? Yeah. yeah. So, Danny, thank you again so much for getting up early and joining us from the West Coast. We really appreciate it. It's been a great conversation. And uh, people should get in touch with you if they want to write music with these symbols, right? That would be awesome. I would love do it. You have, do you have a, a, a preferred way for people to do that? Um. Yeah, if you want to, let's see, uh, send, uh, there, there's a Project Object uh, Facebook page. Okay, um, mm-hmm. we'll, find, yeah, we'll link to it. that. Yeah, and I've then, got it pulled up. Cool, and then, yeah, feel free to just send me a message on there. It's it's just me, despite the fact that I use the word we to make it sound more official. Yeah. It's just, it's just me. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah. we do that, we do that here, too. I'm at Sound, Sound Notion Global HQ here. Um, you know, have to clear, have to clear some of these plugs with legal up on three. Um, but the dude, it's, it's the royal we, you know, <laughs> the royal we. Yeah, the so, royal we. So uh, it's been it's been a great conversation this week. We will have links to uh, all of the stuff that we talked about with Danny and all of his his many interesting projects on our show notes at townnotion.tv slash sn. If anybody would like to, you know, leave a comment on the show, you can do that there. If you are listening to this and you, you think, man, I wish I could check this stuff out live, we do stream the show live uh, at soundnotion.tv slash live. And you can you can check us out live and join us in the chat room there. There's always a, an interesting conversation. Thank you to everyone who did that this morning. 
Um, this show and all our shows are available in the iTunes store or wherever finer podcasts are aggregated. You can, uh, of course, connect with us there on our site. You can connect with us on Facebook, uh, on Twitter. We're at Sound Notion. Uh, you can subscribe to us on YouTube. Find us on Tumblr, blog.soundnotion.tv. Um, and all of, those, all of those places, we're happy to continue this conversation about uh, education and, and composers in schools. Um, it's, it's a really interesting topic and something that I think we want to continue to discuss on the show in the future. Um, so if you even have any ideas about other projects that are like this or might complement this or might make a good topic for the show, tweet it at us with hashtag SN Weekly, and we always check that out as we're preparing topics for the show. Um, so thank you to everyone who does that as well. If you'd like to support the show, the best way to do that is to tell your friends about the show, leave us nice, kind reviews in all of the places that you can leave us nice, kind reviews. Um, and if you'd like to, to support us monetarily, you can do that using the links on our site. If you want to do it for free, you can use the Amazon search box on the right side of our site. Uh, if you just buy your regular Amazon purchases by that link, uh, or we'll your get a incredibly extremely expensive Amazon purchases. Yeah. So you know, the <laughs> next time you're buying a, a, a an iPad or a or a, a a digital SLR camera, just buy it through our link, and and that'll be very helpful to us. Um, <laughs> so just buy a stinking camera, and we'll 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 be set. Um, so. Uh, <laughs> That's all, that's all there is to it. Use that link. It doesn't cost you anything, but we get a tiny little commission that helps us out a lot. Thank you to everyone who does that as well. Sound Notion's introduction includes music by Patrick Gulo and video by Tyler Lepp. Thanks again so much for watching or listening, and we'll be back next week.